Okay. Hi, Gary. How are you? Doing good, Douglas. Thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Oh, I look forward to this uh, this call. Um, I was looking at your bio. You've done so many things. I don't think we're going to have time to, in our short little interview here, to cover them all. Oh, so, <laughs> um, but I did want to ask you about a couple of them. Okay, first one was inventor with six patents. What have you invented? Yes, I invented a lot of things, but I have six patents on uh, one is a design patent that automatically uh, uh, delivers basically bulk and packaged goods. And then along with that, I developed uh, uh, four engineering patents. And then my last patent uh, was actually issued after I retired because it takes years sometimes to get complex patents. But that's a biomass patent. That's a, also a processing patent where I can take uh, basically fields, we'll say a field of green corn, and convert it to a liquid in 24 to 72 hours. Wow. So that's for making like biodiesel or ethanol or something like that? Yeah, it can be for biofuels. There can be some other purposes. But the main purpose is to be able to transport that mass via pipeline, which is far more efficient than trying to truck uh, lots of water and, and mass. Well, but yeah, definitely I true to a biofuel. Societal Explorer? Explain yeah, that, that one. <laughs> that, that's an interesting one that my wife and I came up with because uh, since we retired in 2012, we traveled. We didn't have a house. We didn't have a permanent apartment. We had an RV for a couple of summers, but we uh, traveled throughout the U.S., uh, went um, overseas and, and uh, uh, a lot of different countries, Australia, other places. But each place we went, we experienced different cultures. Um, some developed, some semi-developed, some countries like Fiji has everything from developed areas to totally undeveloped areas. And so uh, the best term that we came up with was societal explorers. Yeah, okay. What was your impression of uh, the United States as a whole? Did you have anything that I mean, I know you're American and uh, but when we look at our own country, sometimes, you know, we have different takes on the thing as a whole, especially if you go out of the country and you look at it from outside looking in, your perceptions can change. So what was your take on it? My take is that that uh, whatever country, whether it's US, Canada, uh, Western Europe, um, we all seem to follow a, a fairly developed uh, culture. Uh, we, you know, use modern means of communication. We still use old things like transport, transporting kids to school rather than uh, e-learning. E but then our, our systems in developing and develop, developing countries, they would prefer to, to mock or follow uh, developed countries like the U.S. We just have so many standardized systems that it and with uh, uh, worldwide media uh, that other countries tend to copy what's going on in uh, Western Europe or uh, North America. In uh, uh, undeveloped countries, um, or I'll, I'll say developing, for example, in 1997, I went to Turkey and spent a month over there and everybody had cell phones. I mean, everybody on the street had a cheap cell phone. And uh, what I realized coming back to the States is that we developed a hardwired system, hardwired communication system. Every office, every home had hardwire, but most people were carrying around a cell phone if they were in, you know, in business in the late 90s, but, but uh, not you know, wives and children in school. And so what, what really changed was that countries that did not have the ability and still don't have the ability to invest in I'll call it hard brick and mortar or uh, uh, hardwire communication, put up a few cell towers, come up with cheap cell phones and communicate that way. So they bypassed a lot of this uh, uh, infrastructure, hardwired, hard brick and mortar infrastructures that we think was uh, in, at the time in the 20th century, that was modern. It's not anymore. Uh, I have to agree with you on that. Years ago, I uh, lived in Thailand for three years and I taught English. Oh, and I noticed that a lot of people in the small village that I was at had cell phones and no indoor plumbing. 
<laughs> so I, I kind of liked that priority. I thought, yeah, you know what? I'll use the outhouse as long as I have communication. Uh, yeah. It was pretty funny. Well, we've transitioned. In fact, we're being forced to transition 21st century to more efficient means of uh, communication. It's not efficient to put kids on a school bus, for example, and transport them to a brick and mortar school, transport the teachers there, instruct in a square block room, and uh, expect that to be the most efficient means of learning. Uh, it's, it's basically turned out, uh, speaking a societal explorer, what we've noticed is uh, so, uh, Western society uh, almost expects that school now is a social function rather than the primary purpose of learning. Well, it's true. Do you think that uh, online learning is going to be the wave? I mean, it's happening now sort of forcefully because of COVID, but the statistics I've seen coming in aren't very encouraging. I mean, kids are failing at a higher rate over the last few months because of COVID and e-learning. Sure. I don't know. Sure, because we have not developed the, the, the teachers or the expectations of the students so anytime you change systems, you're going to have a, uh, a troubling transition period. When you change jobs, you didn't automatically uh, know how to teach in Thailand. I mean, yes, you had the background skills, but you learned as you got over there the first few months. And so to expect uh, young children to automatically, and teachers, very professional, but expect teachers to switch their uh, teaching materials to an online system and the tests and the uh, um, the intimacy that they have with the student, it's going to take time. So you think this is just a systems adjustment that's oh, without a doubt, without making a doubt. everyone crazy. Yeah. Yeah. The school system, for example, developed under a uh, mid to late 20th century efficiency in transportation. Uh, early in the 20th century, 100 years ago, that was not the case. And so uh, most children learned almost everything at home. And then as you got into the late 18th, uh, and into the late 19th century, there was a transition to uh, transport uh, or kids would walk or take a horse, whatever, to school. And the teachers usually stayed at school. Well, that transition to the, the mid to late 20th century to transporting children to a, a brick building, basically, and teaching them there and then sending them home at night. That's, that's based on uh, mechanical uh, efficiency of transportation. As we got out, uh, towards the end of the 20th century into the 21st century, uh, we've transitioned work. I worked at home most of my working career and uh, uh, traveled from there. Uh, but uh, we're, we're not only seeing it with students, we're seeing it people work at home. There's they're building efficiencies. There's obviously different modes of communication like we're doing now on Skype and others that we can uh, become what I would call a 2D. But there's going to be as I write in my book, Learning as it Influences the 21st Century, there's a transition to a um, transition to 21st century, which is going to find efficiencies, which are uh, uh, digital, which are uh, currently electronic. Okay, is the idea of converting education to e-learning, is that purely from a logistical point of view, or is there some actual learning improvements that come from that system? There's learning improvements. There are certainly drawbacks, uh, like the one-on-one, the, the -on -one, you, you touch a person's shoulder when you're looking over their homework or something like that. Uh, you may not have that type of intimacy. But toddlers, uh, you, you, you give a baby, not even a toddler, a baby, an iPhone, and they learn how to swipe. They've, they've grown up on this system. And to then expect them to, okay, but we're going to put you on a bus the next 12 years and we're going to transport you to a building. And then you get to use it sometimes. It's, it's, uh, it's just a transition. And uh, as I wrote and released my books two years ago, there's no doubt in my mind we're going to transfer work and where, where necessary or where convenient and where efficient, uh, transfer uh, students and workers to a, uh, an efficient means of transportation and bypass the, the mechanical, you have to get in your car and you have to go at this time. The, the benefit of the student, and you mentioned them, I think it's key, as well as worker. Students don't learn on a time clock and we've forced them into a time clock where now they can 
basically read at their le leisure or take more time with a problem or study a paragraph longer to uh, have themselves understand it at their rate, not at the expected rate in the classroom. Okay. What about socialization skills? It seems to me kids these days are have many virtual friends, but they don't. But interaction with people on a real basis seems to be lacking. Yes, yes. Again, that to me is a transition, and that deals with my book, Culture and the Mysterious Age and Changing It. Culture is changing. And one of the reasons is that we have set an expectation from toddler or sh shortly after toddler stage to take them either to a, a daycare, daycare or preschool and, and keep them in an institution. But we are actually transitioning to the history uh, of, of uh, traditional culture, meaning that parents and students uh, all the way through teens are learning at home, just like they used to be for thousands and thousands of years. And so uh, really the late 20th century and early 21st century was an anomaly. And so I, I write relating to ancient series. That's my series of books. And so I compare uh, uh, previous cultures with today's. Uh, and I'll give you one example of how people learned independently. Albert Einstein was a was a smart guy. I mean, the guy was brilliant, but he died in my father, you know, he died after my father was born. But he spent from, I think it was uh, 1907 to 1915 working on his gravitational theory. And it wasn't published until two, uh, 1916, 1916. It took a hundred years. In 2016, scientists finally proved using spacecraft and others, uh, other systems, to actually confirm his theory of gravity, which refuted Newton's 300-year-old theory of gravity. So some of these things take long-term thought. And so we're, we can't just rely on students answering a quick question, A, B, and C, or uh, a snippet of information, because they have to learn how to generate long-term thought and long-term ideas. And that's what creates societal evolution into uh, a more efficient, a more uh, satisfying system. Yeah, okay. I, I agree with you on the ideas of e-learning. I'm just concerned that we're swapping out one thing for another and I'm worried about people's ability to socialize okay, on a real were, level. Were, were you worried about the, the Egyptians, the Romans, um, uh, the, the, the pilgrims that settled this country? Uh, uh, their socialization skills when they did it at home? Um, I don't mean just specifically school. I mean, if you take away the the actual getting together of the kids at school, sports events, extracurricular activities, all of that stuff's going to disappear if you no. No, eliminate brick and mortar no. schools. No, no, I disagree. I disagree fully because that's like saying you can't take a dance class or a piano lesson from a, a private teacher or a local uh, dance club. Uh, a lot of these activities have happened at school, but certainly the, the, the basketball and baseball didn't start at school. Soccer certainly didn't start at school and they still play soccer. Uh, right, but I think for some kids that is their only source of and why is that? Socializing. Why is that? Because we have provided as a, as a culture, call, we and the, uh, the, the more developed uh, countries, a system to transport them in to make that. So last year we were in, uh, we, we have a, a girl, an orphan girl that we sponsor over in, in Uganda. And so we went to Uganda to see her. And she's, I think, 15 now and uh, uh, lives in a family compound uh, as an orphan. She's staying with her paternal grandfather. Uh, she's the only one that goes to school in that family compound. And our goal was to uh, uh, be able to have her go to school and bring back knowledge of math and, and reading and uh, literature and communications into her village. They have no running water. They have no electricity. They don't have a bicycle. They have nothing mechanical. And so, uh, there are places in the world like that that, that uh, um, 
they're, they're wonderful people. They just don't necessarily have the tools that we think are required. Uh, okay. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap this up. Our time is up. Uh, your book quickly was Destination North Pole. Yeah. Is that your latest book? Okay. And this was about uh, a bike trip? Yes, uh, I, I biked uh, from Pierce, South Dakota, 3,000 miles to North Pole, Alaska. And I did it in 40 days. I got there three weeks early. And uh, I, I'm promoting it not only as an armchair read, but obviously a bicycle guide and something that really, I was 65 when I did it. So it's something that any, anybody can do and I laid out a guide for them to try it. Super. Do you have a website you want to give out? Yes, it's relatingtoancients.com. Uh, relating to ancients.com. But uh, like my books, uh, most people get them on Amazon just by entering my last name, Whitgriff, or, or the title of the book. And my New York distributor, uh, booksch.com, is where uh, a lot of people get my books also. Okay. Gary, thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, best of luck with everything you're doing. All right.